The Butterfly Lion Tim Bavati Bavati was born in South Africa in a remote farmhouse near a place called Timbavati. It was shortly after Bertie first started to walk that his mother and father decided that a fence must be put around the farmhouse to make a compound where Bertie could play in safety. It wouldn't keep the snakes out, nothing could do that, but at least Bertie would be safe now from the leopards and the lions and the spotted hyenas. Enclosed within the compound were the lawn and gardens in front of the house and the stables and barns at the back. All the room a child would need or want, you might think. But not Bertie. The farm stretched as far as the eye could see in all directions. 20,000 acres of felt. Bertie's father farmed cattle. But times were hard. The rains had failed too often, and many of the rivers and waterholes had all but dried up. With fewer wildebeest and impala to prey on, the lions and leopards would sneak up onto the cattle whenever they could. So Bertie's father was more often than not away from home with his men guarding the cattle. Every time he left, he'd say the same thing. Don't you ever open that gate, Bertie. Do you hear me? There's lions out there, leopards, elephants, hyenas. You stay put, you hear? Bertie would stand at the fence and watch him ride out, and he would be left behind with his mother, who was also his teacher. There were no schools for a hundred miles, and his mother, too, was always warning him to stay inside the fence. Look what happened in Peter and the Wolf, she would say. His mother was often sick with malaria, and even when she wasn't sick, she would be listless and sad. There were good days, days when she would play the piano for him and play hide-and-seek around the compound, or he'd sit on her lap on the sofa out on the veranda, and she'd just talk and talk all about her home in England and how much she hated the wildness and loneliness of Africa and about how Bertie was everything to her. But they were rare days. Every morning, he'd climb into her bed and snuggle up to her, hoping against hope that today she'd be well and happy. But so often she wasn't, and Bertie would be left on his own again, to his own devices. There was a waterhole downhill from the farmhouse and some distance away. That waterhole, when there was water in it, became Bertie's whole world. He would spend hours in the dusty compound, his hands gripping the fence, looking out at the wonders of the felt, at the giraffes drinking, spread-legged at the waterhole, at the browsing impala, tails twitching alert, at the warthogs snorting and snuffling under the shade of the Shingai trees, at the baboons, the zebras, the wildebeest, and the elephants bathing in the mud. But the moment Bertie always longed for was when a pride of lions came padding out of the felt. The impala were the first to spring away. Then the zebra would panic and gallop off. Within seconds, the lions would have the water hold to themselves and they would crouch to drink. From the safe haven of the compound, Bertie looked and learnt as he grew up. By now he could climb the tree by the farmhouse and sit high in its branches. He could see better from up there. He would wait for his lions for hours on end. He got to know the life of the waterhole so well that he could feel the lions were out there even before he saw them. Now Bertie had no friends to play with, but he always said he was never lonely as a child. At night, he loved reading his books and losing himself in the stories, and by day his heart was out in the felt with the animals. And that was where he yearned to be. Whenever his mother was well enough, he would beg her to take him outside the compound, but her answer was always the same. I can't, Bertie. Your father has forbidden it, she'd say. And that was that. 
the men would come home with their stories of the felt, of the family of cheetahs sitting like sentinels on their copier, of the leopard they had spotted high in his tree larder, watching over his kill, of the hyenas they had driven off, of the herd of elephants which had stampeded the cattle. And Percy would listen wide-eyed, agog. Again and again, he asked his father if he could go with him to help guard the cattle. His father just laughed, patted his head and said it was man's work. It did teach Bertie how to ride and how to shoot too, but always within the confines of the compound. Week in, week out, Bertie had to stay behind his fence. He made up his mind, though, that if no one would take him out into the felt, then one day he would go by himself. Something always held him back. Perhaps it was one of those tales he'd been told of black mamba snakes whose bite would kill you within ten minutes, of hyenas whose jaws would crunch you to bits, of vultures who would finish off anything that was left so that no one would ever find even the bits. For the time being, he stayed behind the fence. But the more he grew up, the more his compound became a prison for him. One evening, Bertie must have been about six years old by now, he was sitting high up in the branches of his tree, hoping against hope the lions might come down for their sunset drink, as they often did. He was thinking of giving up, for it would soon be too dark to see much now, when he saw a solitary lioness come down to the waterhole. Then he saw that she was not alone. Behind her, and on unsteady legs, came what looked like a lion cub. But it was white, glowing white in the gathering gloom of dusk. While the lioness drank, the cub played at catching her tail. And then when she had had her fill, the two of them slipped away into the long grass and were gone. Bertie ran inside, screaming with excitement. He had to tell someone, anyone. He found his father working at his desk. Impossible, said his father. You're seeing things that aren't there, or you're telling pigs, one of the two. I saw him, I promise, Bertie insisted, but his father would have none of it, and sent him to his room for arguing. His mother came to see him later. Anyone can make mistakes, Bertie dear, she said. It must have been the sunset. It plays tricks with your eyes sometimes. There's, there's no such thing as a white lion. The next evening, Bertie watched again at the fence. But the white lion cub and the lioness did not come, nor today the next evening, nor the next. Bertie began to think he must have been dreaming it. A week or more passed, and there had been only a few zebras and wildebeest down at the waterhole. Bertie was already upstairs in his bed, when he heard his father riding into the compound and then the stamp of his heavy boots on the veranda. We got her, we got her, he was saying. Huge lioness, massive she was. She's taken half a dozen of my best cattle in the last two weeks. Well, she won't be taking any more. But his heart stopped. In that one terrible moment, he knew which lioness his father was talking about. There could be no doubt about it. His white lion cub had been orphaned. But what if, but his mother was saying, what if she had young ones to feed? Perhaps they were starving. So would we be if we let it go on. We had to shoot her, his father retorted. Bertie lay there all night, listening to the plaintive roaring echoing through the veld as if every lion in Africa were sounding a lament. He turned his face into his pillow and could think of nothing but the orphaned white cub, and he promised himself there and then that if ever the cub came down to the waterhole looking for his dead mother, then he would do what he had never dared to do. He would open the gate and go out and bring him home. He would not let him die out there all alone. But no lion cub came to his waterhole. All day, every day, he waited for him to come. 
but he never came. Bertie and the Lion. One morning, a week or so later, Bertie was woken by a chorus of urgent neighing. He jumped out of his bed and ran to the window. A herd of zebras were scattering away from the waterhole, chased by a couple of hyenas. Then he saw more hyenas, three of them, standing stock still, noses pointing, eyes fixed on the waterhole. It was only now that Bertie saw the lion cub. But this one wasn't white at all. He was covered in mud with his back to the waterhole and he was waving a pathetic paw at the hyenas who were beginning to circle. The lion cub had nowhere to run to and the hyenas were sidling ever closer. Bertie was downstairs in a flash, leaping off the veranda and racing barefoot across the compound, shouting at the top of his voice. He threw open the gate and charged down the hill towards the waterhole, yelling and screaming and waving his arms like a wild thing. Startled at this sudden intrusion, the hyenas turned tail and ran, but not far. Once within range, Bertie hurled a broadside of pebbles at them, and they ran off again, but again not far. Then he was at the waterhole and between the lion cub and the hyenas, shouting at them to go away. They didn't. They stood and watched, uncertain for a while. Then they began to circle again, closer, closer. That was when the shot rang out. The hyenas bolted into the long grass and were gone. When Bertie turned round, he saw his mother in her nightgown, rifle in hand, running towards him down the hill. He had never seen her run before. Between them, they gathered up the mud-matted cub and brought him home. He was too weak to struggle, though he tried. As soon as they had given him some warm milk, they dumped him in the bath to wash him. As the first of the mud came off, Bertie saw that he was white underneath. You see, he said triumphantly, he is white. He is, I told you, didn't I? He's my white lion. His mother still could not bring herself to believe it. Five baths later, she had to. They sat him down by the stove in a washing basket and fed him again. All the milk he could drink, and he drank the lot. Then he lay down and slept. He was still asleep when Bertie's father got back at lunchtime. They told him how it had all happened. Please, father, I want to keep him, Bertie said. And so do I, said his mother. We both do. And she spoke as Bertie had never heard her speak before, her voice strong, determined. But his father didn't seem to know quite how to reply. He just said, we'll talk about it later. And he walked out. They did talk about it later. When Bertie was supposed to be in bed, he wasn't, though. He heard them arguing. He was outside the sitting room door, watching, listening. His father was pacing up and down. He'll grow up, you know. He was saying, you can't keep a grown lion. You know you can't. And you know we can't just throw him to the hyenas, replied his mother. He needs us. Maybe we need him. He'll be someone for Bertie to play with for a while. And then she added sadly, after all, it's not as if he's going to have any brothers and sisters, is it? At this, Bertie's father went over to her and kissed her gently on the forehead. It was the only time Bertie had ever seen him kiss her. All right, then, he said, all right, you, you can keep your lion. So the white lion cub came to live amongst them in the farmhouse. He slept at the end of Bertie's bed. Wherever Bertie went, the lion cub went too, even to the bathroom, where he would watch Bertie have his bath and lick his legs dry afterwards. They were never apart. It was Bertie who saw to the feeding, milk four times a day from one of his father's beer bottles, until later on, when the lion cub lapped from a soup bowl. There was in parlour meat whenever he wanted it, and as he grew and he grew fast, he wanted more and more of it. For the first time in his life, Bertie was totally happy. The lion cub was all the brothers and sisters he could ever want, all the friends he could ever need. 
The two of them would sit side by side on the sofa out on the veranda and watch the great red sun go down over Africa, and Bertie would read him Peter and the Wolf. And at the end, he would always promise him that he would never let him go off to a zoo and live behind bars like the wolf in the story. And the lamb cub would look up at Bertie with his trusting amber eyes. Why don't you give him a name? His mother asked one day. Not because he doesn't need one, replied Bertie. He's a lion, not a person. Lions don't need names. Bertie's mother was always wonderfully patient with the lion. No matter how much mess he made, how many cushions he pounced on and ripped apart, no matter how much crockery he smashed, none of it seemed to upset her. And strangely, she was hardly ever ill these days. There was a spring to her step, and her laughter pealed around the house. His father was less happy about it. Lions, he'd mutter on, should not live in houses. You should keep him outside, in the compound. But for both mother and son, the lion had brought new life to their days, life and laughter. 